The Sunfoil Project by CJ Wharton's Aero Hillbilly Enterprises. G'day, my name's Chris Wharton. I am the Aero Hillbilly behind the Enterprise. I look a bit like a mad scientist, maybe a fool on the hill, rampant greeny even. But uh, the madness isn't dangerous and the science is pretty good. You see, I pay rates on an endangered species sanctuary where I use trespassing sheep for archery practice and that's because they're no good for the wild native parsnips and I'm no good with a spear and a woomera. But at the front gate of the endangered species sanctuary I've got a little research and development station and I've been conducting pretty interesting studies into various forms of alternative energy. I happen to have discovered something fairly important and I'd like you to pay attention. My front yard is decorated with lots of windmills. They're all over the place, various kinds. Hold experiments. This is a good one. I'd like you to pay attention to this one. This is the one that taught me how hard it is to get electricity out of a motor car alternator. It's a high speed turbine rotor with an 11 to 1 tip speed ratio. It's got four blades to give it better resistance to turbulence and it's got offset geometry so that it's self furling. It's also got an air operated switch so it'll turn itself on when there's enough wind to make electricity with and turn itself off when there's not enough wind to make electricity with. That's most of the time actually. The big lesson from this is how hard it is to get power out of an alternator. The manufacturer says it's 50% efficient. So if you want one horsepower of electricity to come out of these terminals, the sad fact is you have to put two horsepower into the driven pulley. And there's a minimum speed below which the alternator will not produce any power, but it sure will consume the power. And therefore we need to have a two to one step up. So the two horsepower became four horsepower due to the RPM difference. And the step-up belts are terribly inefficient. They lose half the power they transmit to heat and friction and slippage. So, ten years ago, this became a piece of dynamic sculpture and I invested in a solar panel. That little one in the middle is the first one I bought and I added to the collection and I designed and built my idea of a tracking array for it, which I call the Tower of Power, which feeds direct current into the power shack, which is full of batteries. As you can see, it's a bit of a spaghetti nest of wires and gauges, and it's making a humming noise at the moment because the inverter's running feeding the radio and the mobile phone charger back over at the hut. But all these batteries came from the dump, some of them five years ago. And the reason they were on their way to the dump is because most motor cars don't run for long enough to charge the battery. This little inverter, which was making all the noise, makes 240 volt alternating current out of the 12 volt direct current. And when there's not enough sun, there's a backup generator inside the power shack. Now, perhaps because the power shack is in the shape of a pyramid lined up with magnetic north, and perhaps because the crankshaft of the backup generator is lined up with magnetic north, or perhaps because I'm good at uh, engine maintenance, this little thing's run 3,419 hours 56 minutes in this location. When I didn't have quite so many solar panels, it used to run maybe four hours one day in three. Nowadays it runs one day every 12 days perhaps. It's a two-stroke generator, and being a two-stroke generator, the engine is 20% efficient at turning fuel into torque. There's no step up belt at all and the alternator is 50% efficient at turning torque into electricity. 
So 10% of the fuel becomes electricity one day in 12 because it's a backup generator. Maybe I'm a little bit slow on the uptake, but I've been aware of how much power it took to get electricity out of an alternator ever since I gave up on windmills. But it wasn't until three years ago that I paid attention to what's happening under the bonnet of a normal motor car. The trigger event was when my electric windows were failing to operate. As it happens, my son is an apprentice auto electrician. So three years ago for my birthday, he borrowed my car to see what was wrong with the windows. And he gave it back a week later and said, Dad, your battery was half flat. It took 35 minutes with the engine doing 2,000 revs with a two to one step up belt, driving the alternator. So the alternator was doing 4,000 revs and it was its peak efficiency. And after half an hour, 35 minutes, he said, your battery came up to 13.3 volts. And in those days, the battery was twice the size of this one. And I thought to myself, gee, I wonder how the battery got to be that flat. For the first time in my life, I did the maths on it. And I realized that whereas cars are designed with an electrical system that takes 45 minutes to fully recharge the battery after every engine start, I live 15 minutes out of town maybe 18 minutes. So my battery was never, ever, ever being fully recharged. And it had stabilized part flat so that it was able to suck between half and three quarters output from the alternator. So a two to one step up, we know full output from a 50 amp alternator takes eight horsepower. And I was driving around the place with somewhere between four and eight horsepower permanently going into the drive belt to feed the alternator because the battery was permanently part flat. By the time Father's Day 2008 arrived, my son gave me a Crazy Prices solar powered battery charger to go under the windscreen. And I tried it, but it wasn't big enough. Now it stands to reason that if one solar panel isn't enough to run the pyramid and the entire house, but I needed more panels for the house, and if one panel wasn't enough for the car battery, therefore I decided five of them in a streamlined array would be really good for the motor car. And on the 5th of December 2008, I fitted this thing to my car. And it's flat on the bottom. It's got a 45 degree trailing edge facet. It's got swept leading edges and trailing edge tips, 45 degree leading edge. Aerodynamically, it's designed to be drag neutral at 90 kilometres an hour. It actually reduces the drag of the vehicle by 1% at 100 kilometres an hour. But its main function was to finish recharging the battery after I switched off. And it did that, and it also, strangely, saved about 10 to 12 percent of the fuel burn. Out of a 15 litre per week fuel burn, I saved one and a half litres, sometimes 1.7 litres. So, after six months of watching Dad drive around with a thing that looked not unlike a spaceship on the roof, my son said, Okay, you're allowed to put a solar array on the roof of the ute. This thing's now retired. It lives out its retirement charging nickel cadmium drill batteries or it can use the onboard regulator to charge car batteries. So in June 2009 for his 20th birthday I fitted the second prototype Sunfoil onto his Subaru Brumby which has the same engine and gearbox and wheel diameter as the touring wagon I drive, which gave us a nice comparison. The Mark II on top of the Brumby is a 20 watt silicon panel. It's 2.66% of the battery's rated capacity 
in terms of the solar panels output in amps and it saves 21.9 percent of the Brumbies pre-modification fuel burn with the same driver and the same loads on the same roads at the same speed so we're pretty happy with that in fact I was so happy with the performance of the second prototype that I went and purchased a 30 watt gallium arsenide panel and in August I started work on it it went up there on the 21st of August 2010 this is the third prototype we call it a phase 3 magnum sunfoil it's called a sunfoil because it's an aerofoil that runs on sunlight the idea behind the 50 millimeter air gap is not only to let the air inlets scoop air up to cool the undersurface of the panel it puts the roof of the vehicle in the shade so less work for the air conditioning system but this thing doesn't have them and up underneath the trailing edge we have blast tubes getting rid of the hot air and forming a boundary layer airflow control system to stop the sun foil from stalling at highway speeds and it actually reduces the torque burn for aerodynamic drag by 720 watts at 100 kilometers an hour but that's secondary the main feature is it's reduced the fuel burn by 31.09 percent compared to the pre-modification figures so we're pretty happy with that too what made me even happier was that on the 5th of December 2010 two years to the day after the first Sunfoil prototype went up on my car a friend of mine installed the fourth prototype onto his car at his expense with a panel that he bought and instead of using aluminium and pop rivets he used wood and he painted it because he's a carpenter and the V6 Commodore has a 3 to 1 step up ratio between the crankshaft and the alternator so it's 2 and 1 16th percent efficient at turning fuel into electricity whereas my old Subaru was 3 and 1 8th percent efficient so I don't know how much fuel he's going to save but he might be closer to my 31 percent than he was to my son's 21 percent these days there are two kinds of vehicles on the road the ones that have solar auxiliary arrays for their batteries and the ones driven by people who think they have a perpetual motion pulley at the front of their engine that's why they don't think they use fuel to make electricity but I know perpetual motion is bullshit so fit your vehicle with a sunfoil three and a half percent of the battery's rated capacity ciao it isn't rocket science to decide to sit under a sunfoil this kangaroo is sitting under a sunfoil in a rainstorm using it as an umbrella but at least it's smart enough to sit there nobody can stop you from doing it I haven't patented this I haven't registered the design what I've done is I've published all the details in the Glen Innes Examiner which has run four news stories over the past two and a half years you want a sunfoil go your hardest make one please clean up your act for the price of a set of new tires you should be able to save 25 to 50 percent of your fuel burn it is that simple your panel output in amps should be 3.5 percent of the battery's rated capacity in amp hours for optimum results just remember all the best science is not done in universities, some of it happens in the real world.